Do you struggle with worrying about what people think? Do you struggle with obsessively checking comments or with feeling a sense of frustration when people don't understand you online? Do you worry what other people think of you and struggle in general with letting things go? Today, that is some of what we're unpacking on the Possibility Mom Live. Today, we're going to be talking about something that comes up a lot in my coaching. So I help Catholic mothers discover God's um, call for their motherhood and their business. I talk a lot about business here on this podcast and putting your business um, or putting Jesus Christ very much in the center of your business. But I really have a heart for moms in general living out the, the call that God has designed for their life. And a huge way that we basically put a massive blockade, so to speak, in that pathway, in that path of living out exactly what God wants us to be, discerning that and then putting that into action, is by sabotaging our self-worth. And if you can relate to any of the questions that I opened this show with, so if you struggle with being criticized, if you struggle with having um, conversations online and people not understanding you, if you find you have very habitual challenges in your marriage that you can't seem to break, many times, most of the time, (laughs) this comes down to something to do with your self-worth and what you are making these areas of conflict mean about you. And so I want to unpack in no particular order some of the ways that I myself do this to myself and in some of the ways that I see in both my motherhood coaching and my business coaching, I see people sabotage their self-worth in themselves and feel free to chime in if you are watching this live, which of these really resonate with you. And then of course, stay tuned to the end because I am going to share what to do about it all, how to change it if these are things that you struggle with just like I do. Remember, I am a friend on the journey. All of this content, P.S., I know I've shared this before. When I create content, it is almost exclusively because I am struggling with it myself. So I am right in the pool swimming alongside you with basically all of these things. So here we go in no particular order, how to sabotage your your self-worth, how to sabotage your self-worth. Way number one is on social media. Now, I feel like this goes without saying and doesn't need very much of a preamble. Most of you watching this probably have a relationship with social media, probably have a relationship with me on social media. That's maybe how you stumbled upon this podcast or my my content in general. So I don't feel like I need to really explain why social media can be challenging because chances if you're listening to this, you understand. But essentially, This can be a place where we can think we are just like, oh, I have a healthy relationship with social media. I can just like scroll and be entertained and no big deal. But I really want to encourage everyone to really reflect on why you go on social media in the first place. And I think that it's so important that we do a very regular, very healthy audit of what we are looking for when we are there. Pulling back the curtain on myself, I go on social media when I am bored. If there is a quiet moment in my life, like literally, like just any quiet moment, nobody's in the room, my husband leaves the room, my kids leave the room, nobody's talking to me, I will reach for my phone and go on to social media just being very, very honest. 
I have to constantly ask myself the question when I pick up the phone, I have to ask myself the question, what am I looking for? And I mean that in a very practical sense. So sometimes you are looking for something. So, you know, maybe there was something you wanted to look up. Maybe there was something that you, uh, you know, wanted to get back to later and you have a quiet moment. But if you are simply escaping an uncomfortable feeling or you are escaping being bored, that is when we have to have a very healthy audit of how often we do that. What are we escaping? What are we avoiding? What are we trying to not deal with as a result of going on our phone? So a question I think that we can ask ourselves in relationship to social media is what am I looking for and am I really going to find it here? Because of course, what can tend to happen, and I think this is where for business owners, this can get really dangerous because you can, of course, be like, I'm building my business. Every interaction I have on social media means that I'm, you know, building rapport with my audience or what have you. And yes, there can be some truth in that. But of course, if we're starting to measure our self-worth, even in the most unconscious of ways, by the hearts, by the likes, by the comments. A way that you can observe if this is becoming a problem for you is if you go onto your social media and you get disappointed when there are no red notifications. P.S. These red notifications are created in an exact color that is meant to make you addicted and come back. There was work done on the exact color of red that would entice you to become dependent or enjoy seeing that notification. There was intention there when that was created. And so it is such an important thing to unpack that I think for a lot of people, especially business owners, because you can tell yourself you're doing this as a business activity, we've got to simply Um, even in the most unconscious of ways, make more conscious. Like we have to bring all of that to the surface. Am I making this mean something about me? And you can start to see if this is becoming a problem when you get disappointed that there are no notifications. Okay. So social media, I feel like this is a pretty universal one. I feel like this is one that a lot of people can relate to. Um, And social media, of course, is a way and uh, 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 like overuse of social media Overdependence on social media is, of course, a way that we can sabotage our self worth. So that is way number one. Way number two is your job title or success that you experience at work. Now, for those of you who remember my story, I was an interior designer. I had an HGTV show. I worked for many, many years, and I was constantly comparing myself to the success of other people. And As I merged into coaching, of course, this is not universal to my experience. There are so many people who um, I coached in the early years of my coaching who were executives who wanted to leave the executive world in order to be more present to their families, but they had grown so used to the fame, if you want to call it that, and the uh, adulation and the pats on the back and the, the feelings of success, the feelings of Um, I am contributing, I am being praised, I am making money, I'm doing all of these things that are good. And they had so much trouble transitioning to something else where all of those pats on the backs were not present. I I find this too in certain cultures. Certain cultures will have a... um, there's a there's a certain hierarchy, so to speak, of, you know, well, you need to be a doctor. You need to be a lawyer. There are certain, there's a manual, so to speak, of certain jobs that are appropriate in certain cultures. I see this a lot. And so we have to be careful that we are not, of course, attaching our self-worth with our job title. I see this in people who retire, who have spent their whole lives with this identity of a career and sometimes often a very um, healthy one, one that's provided for the family, one that has um, done many things, contributing to the world, contributing to their workplace. And then all of a sudden they retire and the absence of that is so challenging. So a way that you can identify if this is a problem for you or if this is something you struggle with 
what if all of it was taken away? What if your title, what if any kind of like success or ranking up at work or um, acknowledgement, any kind of awards, any kind of ways that you could be celebrated in your career or in what you do for work, what if all of that was taken away? How would you feel? I think that's a really easy way for us to do a gut check if we are sabotaging our self-worth with our job title or success that we experience there. All right. So that is way number two. Way number three, and this one is can be a little challenging. It is simply your family or peer approval of life decisions. Now, I'm a mom of nine. I cannot tell you how many times I have been told the phrase, wow, are you crazy? Or was that an accident? You know, I talk about this in my book, The Possibility Mom, how I had to really navigate. It was not a, an easy thing for me to navigate, to gain confidence in myself for wanting to have a large family or being open to having a large family. I remember when I was building my television career and my interior design career, I had, you know, four babies and essentially like, you know, six or five years, like they were very back to back. And I actually started to believe I was crazy because so many people kept telling me I was crazy. And there was something in me that could not think otherwise. Like I really just, I did not have the confidence. I honestly just started to believe, wow, I must really be outside the norm. I didn't think that there was, um, I don't know, like a, like a, like I had some examples of large families around me, but not a lot of large family examples around me. So there was a real period in my life where I actually started to believe, like, I think you might actually be crazy, Lisa, for wanting something that is so different from most people. We cannot. We, ha we, we, we must accept that we are all on an individual unique path. And that individual unique path has been written by God, but is also granted to you according to your free will. Like you are allowed <laughs> to live a life that might be different than people around you. Now, there is, I think, a natural human tendency to want to be understood. I don't think people come out of the womb. I, I think it's more rare that people come out of the womb being like, I don't care what people think. I, I just think that is a little bit more rare. So I think there is a natural desire to be understood. And so this can be very challenging and we can start to sabotage our self-worth when we make it mean something about us. So like I said with me, wow, I think I actually might be crazy because I can't seem to find any evidence of anything else. Like like this is just what I'm being told often over and over again. And so whatever it is your life decision, like and there are so many decisions when you think about it that could incite the negative uh, feedback of other people, whether you choose to work as a mom or whether you don't choose to work, whether you go to school, whether you don't go to school, whether you homeschool your kids or don't homeschool your kids, whether you vaccinate or you don't vaccinate. That's been a challenging one. Regardless of your life decision, you need to find within yourself the discernment the, the, the way to make that decision that is independent of others and um, have the confidence, the autonomy, the ability to then move forward regardless of how people think. This is very, 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 very challenging. I, I, I cannot tell you how many times I have doubted something and, and really not and in, in the past, not move forward, but really doubted moving forward because of the approval of other people. And so a way that you can just gut check yourself on this is to simply examine who are you fearing of disappointing when you're making big decisions and just be having a real heart to heart with yourself if that is a reason, like that person's disappointment is that really a reason why you shouldn't move forward with said life decision? All right. So that is way number three. So way number one, social media can sabotage your self-worth. Way number two, your job title or success at work. Way number three is your family or peer approval of life decision. 
Way number four to sabotage your self-worth is your spouse and what he thinks of you. Okay. So this is an interesting one. And I find I have only gained wisdom in because of my years of experience being married. Josh and I are now going on 15 years of being married. This was something that came up a lot in my early years. And this is something that I coach people a lot on, especially in the early years. But of course, this can come up later on as well. So Earlier on my Instagram, at Lisa Canning, you can go check out the post. I talked about the love languages, and it was so interesting, some of the feedback I got, mainly in my DMs. So love languages, for those of you who aren't familiar, Dr. Gary Chapman, he talks about how there are five ways that people typically experience love or express love, and they are words of affirmation, acts of service, touch, quality time, and giving gifts. And I just talked about that a little bit about how my husband and I are polar opposites. Now, of course, we can use tools like this to help to have better relationships. So I can understand that my husband's main love language is touch. And so when we sit in a nearby space to each other, I will literally, it's become habitual to just make it a point to reach out and grab his hand because I know how much love, uh, how much touch makes him feel loved. Conversely, my love language, my top love language is words of affirmation. And so when people um, tell me nice things or when people give me positive feedback, it is very helpful to me, I guess, or, or I, I, I enjoy it. It makes me feel loved. Where this becomes a problem is the absence of it. So now I really don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I'm not saying don't communicate with your spouse and tell your spouse what you need. Hear me loud and clear. These are healthy things to have conversations on. But where it can become a little problematic in regards to our self-worth is if they don't do it, what do you make that mean? So for example, my husband and I literally just had this conversation in preparing for this podcast. God bless my husband. He every single week talks through my topics with me. He is incredible at communication. He just also knows like what I am passionate about. So he can often very quickly um, ensure that I am covering the points that I know I would want to cover, but I might forget or what have you. So anyway, he's just been, he's such a gift to me. Um, so we're talking about this exact thing. I, I was telling him, I need words of affirmation and I love it when you give them to me. But I also understand if you don't give them, you still love me. But this can be challenging. Okay. This can be challenging and we have to accept, this is the problem with, with tests sometimes. The problem with tests is sometimes when we take them, we can either put ourselves in boxes or we put other people in boxes and we have to accept that life just doesn't work that way. That people are going to communicate. They have the free will to communicate however they want. And certainly like, you can do things to improve your communication. You can go to therapy and go to counseling. Like you can do many things to improve a marriage, but I think it's really important at the same time that we don't sabotage our self-worth thinking that the absence of my love language preference, for example, means he doesn't love me. And so that is a really important place to spend some time, spend some prayer. Again, don't misunderstand me. I think it's very important that couples talk about how, you know, how to love each other well, the things that they can they can do to improve their relationship. But if the absence of that is there, we also can't make that mean anything about us and our worth. All right. So. Way number four that I think we can self-sabotage ourselves. 
Way number five, and this one is a hard one for me to admit because I really struggle with this one. Way number five, ways that we can sabotage our self-worth are things around birthdays, holidays, and special occasions and what we do or what we do not do. So I am not sure if I've shared this publicly. I feel like I probably have, but my husband growing up, like, like meaning in our, in our marriage, like in the early years of our marriage, he began to really loathe things like birthdays and special occasions because I would have all of these expectations in my head and I would assume he would be able to read my mind. And so when he could not read my mind, which is a very valid um, thing, nobody can read your mind, I would get disappointed and then, of course, launch on all of this stuff on him, you know, unfairly. And so I do think that we have to, again, like just a little gut check, like are there expectations, are there things that you have not communicated that might get triggered around things like birthdays or Valentine's Day or other special occasions that again, if the absence of them occur, you make that mean something about your worthiness. Oh, nobody loves me. Oh, I thought these people cared about me. No. Like, Can we accept that there are people who might care about you and love you? And just like I was talking about with point number four, with your spouse and the love languages, who may not express it in a way that you desire. Like we we have to accept that that is a reality because it is. (laughs) It just is. That everyone has a different set of manuals. Everyone has a different... Um, set of ways that they walk around with either consciously or unconsciously that might not fit yours. And this is really important to acknowledge. All right. So if you struggle with any of these areas, social media, your job title or success at work, your family or peer, peer approval of your life decisions, your spouse and what he thinks of you, birthdays, holidays, special occasions, What do we do instead? If you are listening to this podcast, you are very likely like me, um, who has developed a relationship with Jesus. But in case you are not, in case you've just stumbled upon me on the internet, in case this just randomly came up in a search for you, I want to invite all of us right now to remind ourselves what is the truth of our worth. Our worth comes from God. Our self-worth cannot be placed in anything else, not in social media, not in our job title, not in what our family or our friends think of our decisions, not in even what our spouse thinks of us, not in birthdays, holidays, special occasions, not in our home, not in the kind of car we drive, not in how exciting our life is, not even in what we can produce. Our worth comes solely, singularly, solemente uno, seulement un. (laughs) (laughs) There is one place our worth comes from, and that is from being a child of God. Today, I was talking to my spiritual director, and I was like, no, like, like not that I, not that I struggle with this concept of our self-worth comes from being a child of God. I don't struggle with that, but I struggle with sometimes feeling like it has to be shown to me. He kind of, he giggled a little bit and offered it back to me. He was like, you don't live by faith. You live by sight. (laughs) Like, you know, you want it to be shown to you. And he really challenged me today to remember 
that my very existence, the breath in my lungs, my heartbeat, my physical existence means that I have worth. And it was funny. He was like, okay, like, tell me how you know that God, like, do you have evidence that God loves you? And I was like, well, I sometimes like have consolation and like, yeah, sometimes I can in my intellect remember that God loves me. Um, even when, and, and sorry, he was like, can you, do you have evidence that God loves you even when he doesn't show it? Right. And so then I answered that question, like, yes, in moments of consolation, in moments of like my intellect, I can accept that God loves me, even if he doesn't show it. Or even if I'm thinking he doesn't show it. And he was like, Lisa, you know, I'm surprised you didn't go to the evidence that is sitting right beside you on your sofa. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, your baby. Your baby is an example in a way of this. And he was like, you love your baby, right? You love your newborn. And I was like, absolutely, I do. And you do all kinds of things to care and provide for it. And I was like, yep, I nurse it. I get up in the middle of the night. You know, I provide protection, safety, nurture, care, cuddles, all the things. And he was like, and does Andrew, your newborn, show you right now that he loves you? And I was like, no. <laughs> He can't really. He can sometimes smile. He kind of sort of looks me in the eye, but not really. He's like still too young for that. And my spiritual director was like, and probably he actually gives you more negative feedback. And I was like, yep, he poops on me. He throws up on me. He wakes me up in the middle of the night. He cries when I would prefer to just like sit down, like all that kind of stuff, right? And he was like, can you accept that God loves you even when he doesn't, you don't think he's showing it the same way that, you know, you, you love your baby, even though you are not shown like in his newborn existence, he's not giving you evidence of anything in return. And I was like, yes, Father Damien, I can. <laughs> so if you struggle with this, like I do sometimes, this just like acceptance and and the seeking of your worth in external things, if you struggle with finding this in this intimate, quiet moment that sometimes is not seen, here are a couple things that I want to help help both of us go on. So number one, like I said, clearly define it. Like if you have never defined this, if this is a new concept to you, I just want you, I want to invite you to simply state out loud, I am a daughter of the King. I am a child of God. And because of that, I have worth. Worth that is so much more beyond what I can comprehend or understand. Worth that is not limited by my human existence here on earth and the time I spend here. That it is eternal. These are things that I forget all the time because of my humanness. Like just... Because of my humanness, because I need to drink water, because I need to sleep, because I need coffee, because I have to eat to be alive, because of my humanness, our humanity, we forget this, that our relationship with God is so beyond a time that we can understand. It is eternal. So that's the first step in this, is to just recognize that, state that out loud. If you have never understood that or comprehended that, I invite you to join me in taking that to prayer and inviting God into your heart truly and accepting that that is the reality of your life and mine and invite God into your heart. This is a very quick tangent, but I think we can be raised Catholic or Christian or whatever 
and know this intellectually, but to really invite God into your heart and know this intimately, that you are a child of God and with that you have worth. If you have never had a conversation with God before in that way, if you have never accepted that as reality, I want to invite you to do that right here, right now. The next thing we can do is to recognize our habits. So if you, once we define where our worth comes from, that it comes from God, the next thing we can do is recognize the habits that might currently exist for you. So for example, I, my love language of words of affirmation means that I have developed the habit of expecting and loving words of affirmation. It's, it's simply a natural uh, tendency, right? And so we just need to like, just again, take all the things that I talked about today. And if you need to do this in a notebook or if you just need to do this in your mind, whatever it is, but just take inventory of when you start to doubt yourself, when you start to... Um, uh, criticize yourself when you go into places of shame and blame and doubt and guilt or what have you about your your uniqueness, your wonderfulness, your hu humanness. Like you're, you're, when you go to those places that clearly are not from God, just take a little mental stock. Oh, wait a minute. Is it a habit that when, you know, my... Um, uh, when, when I go on social media and I see no hearts, I start to feel bad about myself. Like just take stock of that. Like, does that happen all the time? Um, when your husband doesn't thank you for preparing a meal and you start to make that mean something about you, you start to feel really bad about that, bad about yourself. Just take stock of that. Like have a bit of an inventory around, um, your, reactions and your tendencies. And what I find helpful, and I do this quite a bit in my coaching, is to sort of identify the vice and the virtue that might be attached to this. So words of affirmation, of course, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with giving feedback and accepting a feedback. But of course, when we start to make that mean something about us either way, right? We can, for example, the, the vice would be I'm informing and, and my pride. My pride is being sort of, um, if left unchecked, if left unexamined, all of these great compliments or whatnot, can start to make me a prideful person. Or if I make them mean something, um, if I give them a lot of weight, then that can start to become a problem where pride is concerned. Pride, by the way, is sort of the root of all sin, <laughs> unfortunately. What is the virtue associated with pride or the virtue that on the backside or the flip side that would help a great deal? And that would be humility. So just to take stock, look at the virtue, look at the vice that might be associated with your current habit. And then we build new habits. So my spiritual director tells me all the time, okay, so pride is a challenge for you, Lisa. I want you to do as many things as possible where nobody sees it. Okay, me revealing this to you is obviously like, I'm just doing this as in the ex. This is like, you, someone could say listening to this, well, this is the opposite of humility, Lisa, you're telling us about it, but I'm using this as an example. Um, uh, if, you, if you struggle with um, uh, the sin of, uh, of sloth, for example, if that like la laziness um, to intentionally get up off of your, your chair, like literally, I know that sounds like a funny example, but like, do things to help build the muscle of what it is you are trying to combat. And then a habit that is sort of universal, that is just so appropriate and necessary for all, is a relationship with our Lord. 
we need to be reminded of God's love. We need to be reminded that our Lord is there for us. And there are a lot of like countless, too many to name, but evidence in scripture of how many times the Lord provides for us or the Lord loves us. I'm going to bring up one of those, um, one of those uh, examples. It was, it was so funny. I was coaching a mom on the topic of the Lord providing for her. And she was, she was just communicating some struggles that she was having around working and um, what we really uncovered and unpacked it was that her desire to work was actually more about being afraid that the Lord would provide for her in general. And it was so interesting because the next day in the Magnificat, which is a small book that has a series of prayers, it has a daily mass readings. Um, I read this from Mark. So this is Mark 8, 14 to 21. Um, okay. So in this, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread and they only had a small amount and they were doubting themselves because they were like, we don't have enough food. Right. And so then the Lord says, um, do you not yet understand or comprehend? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and not see ears and not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many wicker baskets full of fragments you picked up? They answered him 12. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many full baskets of fragments did you pick up? They answered him seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? There is so much evidence in scripture of the Lord's provision and that he loves us. And we need to spend time in that. I don't know how else to say it. And I'm saying this to myself. I, I, I think for some Catholics, scripture is not as habitual. Like it's not, it's just not as habitual. We get a lot of scripture reading in, in mass, but the private practice of reading scripture in my pers- just my observation in myself and other people around me is just not as common. It's not as common to our um, more modern Catholic experience. But what is so important to remember is that the fundamental currency of relationship is time. For us to be in relationship with people, we must spend time with them. And God is not absent of that. For us to be in relationship with God, we must spend time with him. And we can do that through time in the scriptures. We can do that through just quiet, contemplative prayer. We can do that by staying close to the sacraments as Catholics. We can do that in a myriad of ways. But we must have these, as Janice is saying here in the comments, we must have these dates with Jesus. We must have these periods of quality time. We must accept that it's a relationship that we can receive from, obviously, but contribute to. All right, my friends, I hope this was a helpful piece of content for you. If you struggle with things like this, um, will you send me a DM on Instagram at Lisa Canning? I would love to keep this conversation going. If you know someone who struggles with any of the ways that you can sabotage your self-worth, would you just feel free to hit forward and send it to them and let us all link arms as we continue to do this work of knowing where our true worth comes from, investing in that relationship and then developing the habits. And this is where coaching can come in. This is where things like the Metanoia Catholic Academy, the Metanoia Catholic Journal, where so many of these wonderful resources available to us in the human side, the human formation side, there's the spiritual formation side, but there's the human formation side of this. This is why I am so passionate about coaching. 
because this can be a very challenging thing to do on your own. When we are in a habit of expecting praise, for example, when that has become a habit and then you make it mean something about you when you don't receive it, this becomes problematic in everything. And so it can require coaching. It can require a lot of inner healing and work in order to find a new habit to replace that. All right, my friends, we will see you next week where I'm going to be sharing some ways if you are looking, especially if you struggle with social media and the use of your phone in general as a way of escapism, as a way of numbing potentially challenging feelings or numbing um, uh, like a, like a, a vice, you know, that you deal with and you don't want to deal with, I'm going to be sharing how you can journey with me through Lent through, uh, something very exciting that I'm so excited uh, to provide for you completely for free. So tune in next week with that announcement. And I'm just so it's an honor and a joy to spend time with you. See you next time.